Hello, everyone. My name is Tara James Taylor. I lead the Global Beauty Vertical for NIQ. And welcome to the next installment of NIQ's Founders Series. This episode, we will dive into the many facets of launching a beauty brand, from perfecting the formulation and ingredients to securing a meeting with retailers to ultimately getting on shelf and scale. Each episode I host will shine a light on the challenge and successes of startup beauty brand in an ever-growing and complex industry. Today, I'm so very proud to share the story of one of our beauty trailblazers. Our beauty trailblazer program supports emerging minority-owned brands to help them elevate their business models. They will have access to NIQ tools, data, as well as experts, speakers, and mentors from within NIQ and external industry partners. Our goal is to support minority-owned business and expedite their growth. So joining me today to share her story is Dr. Isfahan Chambers, our founder of Alodia Hair Care. Dr. Isfahan is committed to educating women on holistic health approaches to natural hair care. As a woman of color, mother, medical scientist, and trichology practitioner, Dr. Isfahan understands firsthand the perceptions and misinformation that exists around textured hair. Alodia Hair Care was created with the primary goal of educating and empowering women around the globe. This is so exciting. So let's dive in. Welcome, Dr. Isfahan. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. We're so excited to have you. I love this story. Um, there's so many founder stories that start with something that's personal and grounded. So please, I'd love for you to just start sharing the origin of your story of how you came to build this brand. Sure. So Elodia, we started back in 2010, the story of Elodia. And, um, you know, it started off with just me dealing with damaged hair and even a more damaged scalp from years of using chemical straighteners. Like many, many women that have textured hair types, I use chemical straighteners for years. And, you know, right around that time, I started my career as a scientist and I was working at, on a clinical study that looked at a disease called sarcoidosis. And sarcoidosis is an autoimmune disease that primarily affects women and then more specifically black women. So, you know, the two stories kind of intertwine because, you know, as I was dealing with the problems that I was having with my hair and scalp, I was also um, looking at the participants that were enrolling in the trial. And many of them look like me. I saw myself reflected in them. We were around the same age. We had the same hairstyles. We probably used the same products. And, you know, in real time, I realized that maybe these products that are filled with toxic ingredients, um, such as like silicones and petroleum and, you know, in the chemical relaxers, there's so many ingredients that are endocrine disrupting and cancer causing, asthma inducing. So um, the thing about the disease that I was studying, no one knows what causes it. So in real time, I started to say to myself, like, maybe the products that we are using and, and putting on our scalps and on our skin could be contributing to the pathogenesis of certain diseases like sarcoidosis. So, you know, I, that led me down the path of really wanting, really being passionate about creating products that women like myself could trust for themselves and their families. And it just led me down the road of creating these products as a woman scientist, um, creating them free of toxic ingredients and also catering to the textured hair community. Wow. So how long did that take? Like when you have this idea, right? And you're, you're suffering and you're trying to solve it. Like how, how long does that process take? How do you find where to source the ingredients? Yeah, you know, it took a very long time. Of course, when you start out, you're buying off of Amazon and just one offs, you know. But then when in 2014, when I truly started my career and had a little bit more resources to dedicate to creating the line, I actually had to link with a manufacturer in Illinois. And fortunate for me, they were used to dealing with smaller companies, number one. So the, the um, amount of SKUs that you want to create for your inventory could be very low. And mm -hmm. then number two, it was a more turnkey process where, you know, I give them the formula and then they were buying the ingredients and, and packaging and things of that nature. So it made it a bit more streamlined for me um, when I was first starting out. Okay. Tell me a little bit about the name. 
Yeah. So Alodia. So as you can see, my first name is Isfahan, which is unusual. My middle name is Alodia, which is unusual as well. My parents, you know, they, I guess they had um, an idea of how they wanted me to be unique when I was born, but I love Alodia because Alodia is actually an ancient uh, kingdom near the country of Ethiopia. And um, the reason why I thought it was very appropriate for my company is because we source a lot of our ingredients from countries in Africa. So to have that kind of tie with the name, um, I thought it was just very appropriate for the brand. Absolutely. It's, it's such a beautiful connection and it graves so much authenticity, which so many of our consumers are looking for today, especially you. from your background in science, right? I mean, yes. you have a lot of credibility to offer with what you've developed. Um, so we know like you can come up with a great product and now you have to figure out how are you going to get it in retail? I know you're in Target, Amazon. How did you first approach the retailers? So, you know, when we started out in 2017 is when we officially launched, we wanted to be intentional with creating a community first. So we didn't, we didn't have a whole bunch of money to throw at marketing and influencers and things of that nature. So we wanted to build our community first. So we actually took about four years from 2017 to 2021, um, selling direct to consumer and really trying to establish community and um, to have those advocates and those loyalists so that when we launched into Target, they would go out and purchase our product. So that's exactly what we did. We just started off slow. And then in 2021, we said, okay, we have enough of a customer base now. Let's approach um, Target and retail. And um, initially I started out just trying to DM buyers on LinkedIn, um, but that I quickly saw that that wasn't working. So we had to link up a breakthrough. Yeah, <laughs> it was difficult, very difficult. And um, what helped us tremendously is um, linking with a brokerage firm that, you know, had that relationship already and being able to pitch our brand to them so that they took us under their wing um, to help us with the rollout into Target stores. Okay. Are you still working with them today? I am. It's the Creative Partners Group, and they are great. Oh, that's great. I'm so glad that you're able to find success with them as well. Yes, for sure. And so, and, and you mentioned, so D2C, so you, you build your site and you're building a community. Are you out in the, in the market, in the com community? Tell me a little bit about that. Like, how do you actually build this community? How do you get the word out? You don't have a lot of money, as you mentioned for social media. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been an interesting journey. We started off in 2017 doing a lot of little shows and um, like farmer farmers markets events. Yeah. I would do like three a month, which was like every, almost every weekend, um, little things like that, just adding up. Um, it's a lot of work. Exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting <laughs> doing like IG lives and um, those types of farmers markets and vending events. That yeah. was like 2017 to 2018. And then we said, okay, we're getting a little bit more momentum. Let's take some of that revenue and um, hire a freelancer Facebook ad manager. And that was like a game changer for us because it allows you to get in front of a thousand, like thousands of people. You know, you get eyes on you um, and you just have to be creative with the type of marketing material that you are producing so that you can catch somebody's eye and have them stop scrolling. Um, so, you know, that's been something that we've worked on since I would say mid 2018 to current, just creating content. Usually it's me with my iPhone creating content, talking about the product, showing textorial shots and things like that, or we will partner with an influencer. And that has been tremendous for the business, just um, running ads. Absolutely. And it's great. I mean, you have to be very choiceful with, with how you approach that, right? And every dollar that you spend as a, a founder brand, um, yes. I'm, I'm sure there's very hard decisions and tough choices you have to make. Um, so speaking about tough choices or, or decisions, is there anything that you feel along the way, either you wish you had done differently or a challenge that was that came, came your way? And, and let us know a bit about how you handle that. Yeah, that's a great question. I think you, you fail a lot. Like, you know, you make fail, you make a lot of, I won't even say failures, but you make a lot of choices that you have to learn from quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think understanding 
who to partner with because you can't do it all. So you need a team behind you that has integrity and has the moral character um, of someone that you want to work with day in and day out. That's been something that has been um, challenging for me. But over time, when you find a partnership that didn't quite work, you try to learn from that so that the very next partnership that you make, it will be um, it, it will it will work for the brand. Um, yeah. That's been something that, you know, time in and time, day in and day out, I've had to learn from. Um, and then also just I would think of um, like inventory, like buying too much inventory of something that's not working, not really looking at the data and, and looking at the back end and saying, well, you know, this SKU is not really selling, so you shouldn't buy too much of it. Like being able to forecast out um, those were lessons learned so that now when I'm in Target, you know, we have to forecast very well um, yeah. so that we're not losing any money. So things like that. I feel like you you learn from those lessons. You learn from failures yeah. is what I've learned. Um, even as a scientist, you learn from failures. That's the only way to learn. You don't really learn from success. You learn from failures. So just learning quickly and being able to pivot is something that I think any successful entrepreneur has to learn. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, and you're kind of on all the time, right? I, yes. <laughs> my father was an artist and we used to do traveling art shows and I just, all, even just the setup and the put down and then figuring out what everybody wants. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work and and you have to own everything, right? Um, yes. <laughs> from the small tasks, like nothing. <laughs> one one entrepreneur mentioned this recently, like there's no task that's beneath you when you're a founder and entrepreneur, you have to do everything. Um, I love that. And it's, I, I would even add on to that to say that you need to know every task. Because even when you're delegating to someone else, like I need to know how to run my email and my SMS text because something can happen or we, our partnership, uh, you know, it falls apart and you need to know how to pick up the slack. So, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but you know, what drives me is if it's rooted in passion and is rooted in what you truly love to do. So even in those down moments or when you feel overwhelmed, you can fall back on the fact that you feel like you're making a difference and you really, truly love what you're doing. Absolutely. And the packaging is absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. Like it, it's really beautiful. I, I would love to know too, like, is there any advice that you have for other founders coming out, whether it's, you know, how do you figure out how to educate yourself on everything? As you mentioned, like you're accountable for everything. Like, you know, is there anything that you'd like to share out with other founders listening today? You know, I feel that because I look back at myself as an entrepreneur in 2017, I've learned so much looking at myself in 2023 and I still have more to learn, but mm -hmm. I feel that you start where you are. So if you looked at our packaging, I wish I had an old bottle with me. I don't have it here, but you know, it was horrible. It it looked, you <laughs> couldn't read the font. You know, it was like some type of leaf, leaf motif that I took off of like a free site on Google. It, it didn't <laughs> look great at all, but that's what I started off with. And I was pretty proud of it at the time. But now when I look back, I'm like, oh my goodness. But um, you kind of start where you are. And then you, once you get a little uh, revenue in your pocket, you reinvest that money into making your company better. And you always, I, I always stay humble enough to know that I don't know everything. So always stay a learner and always try to educate yourself. Like every week I'm trying to learn something new about the business or connect with someone that knows more than me. Um, I think those are key because you learn from those people and then you say, oh, OK, well, I can work with this type of graphic designer. I don't have to do it myself. And then you just make these little small steps. And then eventually, you know, you get to the stage where you are, where you can um, pitch a retailer and they won't like turn you down because your packaging looks horrible. So um, but even with the packaging that we have today, I'm going through another iteration of making it even more elevated. So you're you're constantly learning. It's like the learning never stops. And that's what I love about um, entrepreneurship. That's excellent. I think that's fantastic advice and staying humble is so important so that you can really grow and continue to evolve as, as you mentioned. Um, okay, so I love to ask this question. What are some of the favorite products that you're using today? 
Oh, you know, I, I always say like hair care for me, I kind of stick with Elodia, but I love skincare, like skincare. I'm a sucker for it. Anything that says like, you know, it makes your skin look smoother, that type of thing. Um, so any, I'm trying to remember, I'm so sorry. It's like slipping my mind. Um, but they have like a oil to milk formulation for your skin. Hmm. For some reason, I can't remember the name of it, but it's their facial um, soap that I like. And then for hair products, you know, I love my Elodia um, Flourish oil, um, which helps with like overall hair health and sheen and um, length retention. Um, but yeah, for some reason, I can't remember the- well, It's a great connection though. I think, you know, everyone talks about the skinification of hair care. Yes become like the importance of it. And I, you know, many of us think it's, it's still, it's still not saturated, right? There's still so many that, that have different needs, um, across different ethnicities and across different, um, hair care types and styles. So, um, it's a, it's a really exciting area to be developed in right now. Yes. And that's what we are all about. The skinification of like the scalp and just that whole scalp care aspect of hair. And I'm remembering the brand now is Coco Kind. So I like Coco Kind. (laughs) Oils and milk. <laughs> it just came to me. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, well, thank you so much, Esfahan, for joining us. It's a really inspirational story. Um, and it's fantastic to see how you're educating everyone on their own health of their um, their hair care products and, and everything they're doing for their body from the outside in. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. It's a wonderful story. And we're happy to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been another episode of NIQ's Founder Series where we dive deep with some of the most innovative brands and founders to unpack how brands launch and grow the CPG space. This video was brought to you by NIQ, where we're revolutionizing the CPG industry and democratizing data and analytics for emerging brands. To learn more, check out niq.com forward slash Bizer, B-Y-Z-Z-E-R. And for all you beauty enthusiasts, ensure you check out our beauty hub for the latest trends and sign up for our newsletter. You can also click the QR code to join Beauty Inner Circle. This permits you to unlimited access to all beauty thought leadership content and events and our private LinkedIn community. Thank you for joining us today and stay well.